The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Today's topic, free trade and American jobs. In late 2011, in a rare display of bipartisanship, Congress passed long-delayed free trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. Supporters say these and other such agreements create increased opportunities for American businesses. Opponents characterize the deals as job killers. Nearly, nearly two decades after the watershed passage of NAFTA, the debate over the impact of free trade policies on our economy still rages. To help us review the free trade scorecard and to look at some options, we're joined by Edward Alden, Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and Co-Director of the Independent Task Force on U.S. Trade and Investment Policy. He's also the former Washington Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. Ted Alden, welcome to International Focus. Good to be here, Rob. Thanks. So I mentioned in the opening that it, so it's been a, a significant amount of time, almost two decades yeah. since NAFTA's come along. And I remember those debates we had, on the one hand, it's it's going to be a giant sucking sound. It's going to take jobs out of the economy and be a disaster. And those who said, no, 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 it's going to be the engine for economic development and jobs. So where did we end up? Well, it's very interesting to look 20 years back because I really think you're right. I think NAFTA was the watershed debate on these issues when they were really engaged by a broader section of the American public for the first time. And I think that the two sides made different arguments. The proponents said, look, this is going to create economic specialization. We'll be able to move up the ladder. We'll, we, the United States, will produce the high technology, high value added products. Some of the labor intensive work will go abroad, but we'll, on the whole, end up wealthier. And you had the opponents saying, well, you know, what will happen if we begin to enter into these trade agreements with poorer economies like Mexico is that the companies are invariably going to invest in places where labor is cheap, where environmental regulations are weak, where uh, worker standards are low, and export from those markets into the United States. And it's interesting, if you look over the history of the last two decades, I think each has been partly right. Um, the 1990s, it was a reasonably positive story. Strong job growth in the United States, falling uh, consumer prices, uh, better quality products uh, imported. Um, the, on the consumer side, that story has continued, but really for the last decade, we've seen a pretty serious impact on the job side. I think there's no question that some of the worries that opponents had about uh, jobs moving overseas really has, we've seen a lot of that play out over the last decade, I think particularly as China entered into the world trading system. So a bit of truth on both sides, I think. We've had some, in, in the last decade, we've had a couple big dislocations, the, the September 11th uh, attacks and the impact of that economically, and then the, the, the depression, recession in, in 2008. So is the trend in terms of the, the, the loss of on the manufacturing job side a product of those those bumps, or is it more just uh, it's sort of independent of those? You know, it's hard. I mean, it's very hard when d discussing these things to sort out all of the factors. But I think you know what we do know. Uh, there has been over the last 30, 40 years um, a kind of secular decline in manufacturing employment. So, so the, the U.S. productivity has gone way up. We produce a lot more manufactured goods than we did 20 or 30 years ago. But the workforce was fairly stable. That was more or less true from the 70s through kind of the end of the 90s. So, a kind of flat or slightly declining workforce, big increase in overall uh, manufacturing production. What's happened in the last decade is, is that employment fell off a cliff. You know, we lost five or six million manufacturing jobs over the decade. I think part of it clearly was the economic recession. I think some of it was certainly 9-11 and particularly the ways in which we discouraged foreign investors. Mm -hmm. um, but a big part of it was certainly trade as well. And I think particularly trade with China because you had you know, a, a huge economy with, with uh, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of, of new workers in effect entering the global economy. It really did change things in some pretty dramatic ways. The best economic studies I've seen suggest that something like a third of the manufacturing job loss in the United States over this decade is associated with trade with China. The other two thirds of other factors, you know, increased productivity and some of the other uh, economic uh, buffets that you mentioned. I mean, do you see, so if we see the trend has kind of been down in, in manufacturing jobs, is that a, 
you know, is it going to be back? Are we in the sine curve? <laughs> are we in the trough of a sine curve, or are we on a trend? Well, I think you know what you what you've seen in the last sort of year, year and a half is a little uptick. So you know, if the if the curve was kind of like you know fairly flat, then like that. Now it's kind of flat. Now it's rising a little bit again. It's not going to go back up to here. I think at best we're going to get you know flat, slight rise. The five six million manufacturing jobs that were lost in this economy are not coming back, and you know a fair number of them disappeared for reasons that you would have to see as positive, which is improved productivity. You know manufacturers in the United States are more technology intensive. They've got machines that run around the clock. Producing high-quality goods was going to continue, but I think some of the the thing that we've seen, I think, is probably at an end, at least for for the for the next little while. Um, in the in that you mentioned that that you did at the council with the task force, um, uh, if I remember the language correctly, you, you talked about the the goal being to uh, help more. Uh, Americans uh, reap the benefits of, of global engagement on the economic side, uh, which is an interesting way of looking at this. So yeah. we're not counting jobs necessarily, but we're just basically saying there are multiple ways people benefit from this, and we want to kind of have more of that. So how would you say we've done so far on that scale? If we just looked at uh, the sort of net benefits and losses to sort of the average uh, person uh, in the society? Well, I think, you know, if you look, really, I mean, we all sort of carry multiple identities. If we think of ourselves as consumers, I think the net benefits have been considerable. I mean, you think of the you know, cost of an average television set or, or, you know, cell phones or other electronic products, much higher quality, much lower price, great gains that we've seen over our lifetime. So I think we, we've all benefited from that. On the employment side, however, the, the, the benefits have been much less equal. Um, you know, really over the last 30, 40 years, wages have been flat for all but college educated and above workers. So you know, if all you have is a, is a high school education or even some college, uh, you've seen either losses in your real wages or, or no improvement over that period. But the last 10 years, the story's even worse, really. The, the only gains, and this was sort of a starting point for our analysis in the task force, only gains have come to the most highly educated segment of the population. So you know, PhDs, MBAs, doctors and lawyers, everybody else, even the college educated, have seen real losses over the last decade. And so, you know, our starting point, you know, trade is not all of this story, right? right. This is technology, there are other things driving this, some of it has to do with government policy, taxation, other things. But, but to, when we're looking at trade policy, we're saying, well, look, on the, on the, the wage and employment side, the benefits of trade have, have been felt very unequally in the United States. And if you're going to build broader support for continuing to move forward on trade, those benefits need to be spread more broadly. So that was a starting point for our analysis. And it was a bipartisan group, you know, fairly equally split between Republicans and Democrats. So, well, I, I want to explore the, both the, the kind of lessons learned and the conclusions that you, you, you pull out of the report. Because like you say, we now have this 20 year or so track record to, to learn from. Um, on the other hand, there's the other question of politically what's possible. And, and the, the task force was able to achieve some bipartisan consensus. Generally, it's been lacking for almost everything in, in, in Washington. So I kind of want to talk about how the political system will deal with this. But maybe if we could start to talk a little bit about what you think are some of the major kind of lessons learned out of this experience that would, that would benefit us now. I think that the biggest overarching lesson is that it's not enough for governments just to negotiate rules that eliminate trade barriers. I think the, the assumption that the United States went into, you know, whether it's the, the, the international talks through what used to be known as the GATT and is now known as the WTO, so whether it's, it's, it's those, those international talks or whether it's regional agreements like the NAFTA, the basic operating assumption was we are the most competitive economy in the world, and so if we lower barriers to trade, that will be a good thing for the United we'll States because anybody. we'll outcompete anybody, and so we will gain. And so we don't actually, as a society, need to think very much about how we're going to compete. We just need to think about eliminating trade barriers. And that really has been the U.S. approach. If you look at a, at a number of other countries that maybe went into the process less confident, they spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to prosper in this new world. A good example of that is Canada. I mean, Canada had wrenching national debates in the 1980s over whether to enter into a free trade agreement with the United States because they understood that the Canadian economy was going to be restructured in some pretty profound ways as a result of entering into that agreement with a behemoth like the United States. And so Canadians spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to attract companies to locate in Canada so we don't see them all move into the United States? How are we going to train a workforce so that we have skilled workers who are attractive to these companies so they'll want to be here? Canadians spent a lot of time thinking about how to prosper after the deal was done. 
United States hasn't done that, and our central argument is we need to move from the phase of simply thinking about negotiating lower trade barriers to thinking about how to prosper within the rules we've negotiated. It's sort of like the corollary to if he, if he build it, he will come. It's if, if we lower the barriers, we will win. We will win. I think, that was the, I think that was the assumption. And, and, you know, for a lot of years, that probably made sense, you know, coming out of, of World War II and for many years after, we were indeed the most competitive economy in the world. But, but the fact is we sold our brand to the rest of the world. You know, we went out mm -hmm. to the Chinas and to Latin America, to the Indias, and said, you know, global capitalism is good. We want you to be part of the game. And they said, okay. And they got quite serious about it. And, and, and these are, are, are countries that are, are effective competitors in a lot of ways. And, and we have to think about how, how we're going to play in that game. We have a few minutes before the break. And I want to I ask a question, which I think a lot of people who, who look at the, the who, who have watched the free trade debates over the last 20 or 30 years. And, and when you think about, say, well, you know, we didn't necessarily prepare for this to compete um, as, as other countries did. Um, has the train left the station, though? Is it too late for us to kind of get into the game and make these investments? I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, economies are extraordinarily dynamic. I think there are things we have lost. I mean, if you look at the, the, the supply chain for consumer electronics, most of that is in Asia right now. You know, we're not going to get back all of those Apple jobs uh, assembling iPads and iPhones in China. Those aren't coming back to the United States. But technology changes in dramatic ways. There are you know, new generations of manufacturing technologies. There are advances in biopharmaceuticals. There are always new industries being generated. So I think you know, there's every opportunity. The United States still remains a very attractive place to invest for a lot of reasons. There's every opportunity, I think, to, to, to see real gains in the future. So no, I don't think the, the train has left the station. This is a, a very, very long ride. And there are always new opportunities to get on, I think. But we're going through a tough patch now. There's no no question about that. I assume when you say that the, the five or six thousand jobs that have left, six million, six sorry. million. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. wrong, wrong unit of measurement. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, that if those specific types of jobs aren't coming back, would would these kinds of investments enable us to bring in to either a, a different kind, a different set of jobs? I mean, a, yeah, I mean, I think at some level nobody really knows, right? Anybody who tries to you know tell you that they know what the economy will look like ten years from now, I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, I think you know based on current trends, we you know we can certainly talk about areas in which the U.S. is very competitive. I think, you know, the whole area of sort of advanced services, business services. So you think about, you know, engineering design. There are countries in the world that are building out their infrastructure, their bridges, their roads. We're the best in the world at designing those and being in charge of those kind of construction projects. There are big employment gains you've seen in that. Uh, software, telecommunications, internet-related services. These are areas where the U.S. actually runs a big trade surplus and the potential for growth is enormous. I think there are clearly parts of manufacturing that it can be expanded further in the United States. Very important for maintaining our lead uh, in innovation. But I, I don't think anybody can tell you exactly where the jobs are going to come from. I think what we can say with confidence is if we as a country just stand back and say, well, the global markets will sort it all out, right. we're not going to come out on top because other countries are thinking strategically about how to gain in the growth industries, and we need to be doing as a country the well, same I thing. I want to come back to what we. Yeah. What, what are the, those strategic things that we can be be doing over the next uh, decade or so? We'll be back in just a moment on international focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about free trade and American jobs with Edward Alden from the Council on Foreign Relations. Ted, I, we, we began to, uh, to talk about, well, so what is it that we need, the U.S. needs to be doing? What kind of investments? How should we be thinking about this next era in, in, in global uh, economic competition? So can you talk a little bit about some of the specifics as to what is it that we should be doing, or the government should be doing, to help us compete better? Yeah, let me, I mean, let me pull a couple of examples um, out of the report. One of the, the recommendations that we had was we called for a national investment initiative that would be a counterpart to the Obama administration's national export initiative. The idea of the, the export initiative is, is it set a goal for the U.S. to double exports over a period of five years. Well, we should, it said there should be a similar goal to expand foreign investment in the United States. Um, the U.S. did very well in foreign investment in the 1990s and very poorly 
over the last decade. Uh, the potential for, for big gain here. There's basically no national effort in this country to attract foreign investment. We don't go out and market ourselves to the world. That's a very uh, interesting, uh, that's a very telling statistic that, yeah. that the main difference being that, that in this two decades, the 90s and the 2000s of, yeah. of the loss of, of foreign investment dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also think, I mean, it, so, so what you're saying, I think also what you're saying is sort of very fundamental here, which is, or revolutionary to some, which is yeah. we think about trade as being about exporting versus bringing capital in. Right. Uh, which I think is uh, most Americans don't don't think in those terms. Well, I think we need to think about trade much more broadly. I mean, we you know, I, I apologize if this is a bit of jargon, but we live in a world of global supply chains. So things are made all over the world. They aren't just made in the United States and exported to Asia, made in Asia and exported in the United States. I mean, you think about the consumer electronics. A lot of the value is still actually added in the United States in the design and the marketing and other things. Final assembly is in Asia, and the parts for your iPhone or your iPad are made all over the world. And so, so the, the issue is, how do we make the United States an attractive place for companies to locate portions of their global supply chain? Well, one of the ways you do is you go and sell it, which a lot of other countries do. We talk in the report about other issues. I think there are real issues around corporate tax. The, the US used to have a relatively low corporate tax rate. Our corporate tax rate now is actually rather high compared to other countries. And there are big questions of, of equity here, but in a world of mobile capital, Taxes matter, and you've got to make the U.S. an attractive place uh, for companies to invest. So there are a range of issues surrounding attracting foreign investment, which I think is 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 a critical part because that's how jobs uh, get created. Um, you know, one of the the things that we you know that we really focus on in in the report is the role of multinational companies. You know, most of the conversation in the U.S. about uh, the economy and jobs is about small business. But in trade, multinationals really are where the game's at. You know, 60% of our exports come from, from the big companies. 85% of the research and development that's done in the United States is done by these big companies. So having them here, having them expanding here really matters. And that didn't happen over the last decade. I mean, in the, in the 1990s, they were expanding abroad. The U.S. headquartered multinationals created about 2.5 million jobs abroad. They created 4.5 in the United States. Last decade, they created another two and a half million abroad and cut three million in the United States. So real change between those two decades. We need to get back on the trajectory we were on in the 90s. You, you also talk some about uh, looking at, at really trying to promote the most competitive yeah. businesses. And, and uh, some may worry that that's sort of uh, a euphemism for you know, picking winners and losers in the U.S. economy. So what, can I talk a little bit more about what, what, what you mean by the most competitive of our industry? Well, I mean, the real divide that we, you know, that we, we hit on here is, is, is in trade negotiations, the focus is, has been pretty much entirely on manufacturing and agriculture. Those have been the sort of two uh, central uh, sectors in, in international and bilateral trade negotiation. Well, if you look at the, at the trade statistics, the, the fastest growing, most successful industries are these service industries that we talked about, these business services industries. These are good jobs. They, they pay uh, as well or better than the best manufacturing jobs. They've been an afterthought in international trade negotiations, partly because these are sectors where it's hard. You know, it's not just a matter of cutting tariffs. They're difficult regulatory issues. But they've never really been a priority in U.S. trade policy. So one of the things we argue is, well, make them a priority. You can see from the trade statistics, these are industries where we do well. And so we should be out there fighting in the world for them. Intellectual property protection is a huge issue for the United States. You know, a lot of our companies, and, and you know, they're realizing this, and some of them are coming back as a result, find their intellectual property gets ripped off in places like China. That's very costly for the United States. That needs to be a front and center issue. So we lay out a number of these issues where we just know from looking at what the economy's done over the last 10 or 20 years, these are our successful competitive sectors. Nobody can predict exactly what the ones in the future will be, but it makes sense to fight for the ones that are winning now and, and open up bigger markets for them. You talk some also about, about uh, trade enforcement, I mean, try, trying to get everybody on a somewhat level playing field. I mean, is that possible? It's, it's extremely difficult. One of the, the slightly depressing conclusions that, that we reached is that, that, without going into too much history, the U.S. used to have the ability to basically say to other countries, either you play fair or we're going to block your products from entering into this market. When the World Trade Organization was created, the U.S. gave away that power in exchange for binding international dispute settlements. So we've now got these independent tribunals that issue decisions and, and they can be enforced through trade sanctions. But in practice, it's been a very slow process and been particularly difficult in dealing with China, you know, where you have a country there that heavily subsidizes a lot of its industries and a lot of American companies and manufacturing and other sectors uh, claim quite reasonably that there isn't a level playing field 
field there. And the remedies are very, very slow. So we, we, we didn't find a silver bullet in the enforcement area, but we recommended that the U.S. government work harder across a range of specific areas in enforcement and encouraged to see the Obama administration actually just announced today the formal establishment of an interagency trade enforcement unit which is really elevating the priority of trade enforcement within the administration so there have been some positive signs in that regard that this issue is becoming a more important one for uh, for the White House. I want, I want to turn a little bit to the to the uh this, the political sphere, because any as we, you've made some allusions to already, is there anything that, that gets done, gets done, will get done through the administration or through Congress or both? Um, and and what's the, what is that playing field like? I mean, this is this is sort of, the, the I guess the the disruptive force in this. We know what maybe we should do, but what we will do is a different question. How 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 do you read the political landscape as it, as it regards trade and, and trade policy? No, I'm, I'm actually, I don't, you know, it's, it's probably a mistake to bet against bipartisanship in anything these days, but trade is one of the few areas where I see real possibilities. I mean, we saw it finally with the passage of the three free trade agreements that, uh, that you mentioned in your opening remarks. I think the issue of, of corporate taxation and how to try to encourage companies to locate in the United States, there are a lot of differences over specifics, but I think there's kind of a bipartisan agreement that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So I see some possibilities for progress there. Trade enforcement crosses both sides. You hear from both Republicans and Democrats that enforcement needs to be a higher priority. Um, the, the current big negotiation that the U.S. is engaged in called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is sort of the slow effort to build up an Asia-wide free trade agreement. There are issues within that, but again, a lot of support from both parties. So I, I think there is the potential here actually for significant progress. The, the criticisms, interestingly, from the Republican candidates uh, uh, have mostly been against Obama for not being tough enough on China. So, you know, you haven't, you haven't heard uh, from Mitt Romney, for instance, that, that no, you know, we should let the Chinese sell their stuff here cheap because that's great for us. He's basically saying we should be tougher on China. So I think there actually is a fair bit of bipartisan agreement on, uh, on these issues. There's been a lot of uh, pushback, uh, especially from the Republican Party, around, you know, government intervention into markets. Domestically, we looked at, at some of the, the issues with uh, the energy sector and, and companies like Solyndra and the loan program. Um, Will there be pushbacks uh, on, a, on a, a government role that's other than kind of get out of the way, which is sort of a mantra on the, on the right? I, I think there, I can see areas where it would be difficult. I mean, one of the things that, that um, we recommended in this, this task force, and, and the Obama administration has been doing some of it, is a much more active export promotion effort. I mean, the Germans do this much, much better than the United States does. They use their embassy folks all across the world to help push German products, um, export financing, which is to help potential buyers of U.S. products. Obama administration has been getting into that game much more aggressively. You hear criticisms, particularly from the libertarian wing of the Republican Party, that, well, this is corporate welfare. This is the government improperly interfering in the pre free market. So I think you will get some pushback when it comes to a kind of much more active role in promoting American businesses and American products. I think you do you do at some point cross some ideological lines there. And are you seeing from the from the, the left and especially the labor unions on the left uh, have pushed back against free trade as, as, as being inherently just bad. I mean it's, it's a, there's yeah. going to be a loser for jobs. Yeah. Have you seen modification in how unions are coming at this question? Um, not hugely. I mean, you know, the unions have still had a, had a pretty united front. They, the exception, interesting, was on the Korea deal and maybe an example of what's possible in the future. The Obama administration actually renegotiated the portion of the Korea deal dealing with auto trade uh, because the Koreans sell hundreds of thousands of cars here every year. Uh, it's actually, I think the numbers are, are bigger than that, may even be in the millions, and we sell a handful of cars in Korea. And so the UAW said, you know, we really need some modification of the provisions in this agreement to help us sell more cars uh, in Korea and protect our market for a, a little longer against Korean imports. Those changes were made to the agreement, got support in the Congress, and the UAW uh, was supportive of the Korea agreement as a result, even though the AFL-CIO as a whole was opposed. I think that shows you what's possible. I think there are 
concrete demands that the unions make that can be dealt with in a way that will at least lessen their opposition to some of these initiatives. I don't, I don't see a, you know, a wholesale change in attitude, but in, in specific cases, I think there, there are possibilities there. We, we have just over a minute left, and I want to give you, of course, your hardest questions for the last <laughs> left minute. Um, so if you were, if you were uh, given the job of advisor to both the Obama campaign and to the campaign of the eventual Republican nominee, what would your single biggest piece of advice be to both? That the United States needs to see itself as a trading nation. And we need to think about policies in education, in the social safety net, and worker retraining, in international trade, in investment. We need to think of all of these from the vantage of what makes the U.S. a more competitive place for companies to locate and expand business. We are in a global competition for investment, and that wasn't true 30, 40 years ago when trade was 10% of our economy. It's 25, 30% now. This is a big competitive world, and we need to play to win in that world. And I would give the same advice to a Republican or a Democratic well, president. If I, if I could quote you from the end of your op-ed piece in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, there is no stop button on the global economy. Yeah. Uh, so you've got, we've got to deal with it. So uh, Edward Alden from the Council on Foreign Relations, thank you very much for for, for your insights today. To our viewers, thank you for viewing, and we'll see you next week on International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 